Hey y'all, Coach of the Fight here, talking about the importance of Passover. We are coming into that part of the year, talking about the Holy Year, when we start our Holy Feast in the month of Abib. So we're talking about Passover. This, of course, comes in, in our Repairer of the Breach series, as we are the restorers of the path to dwell in. From the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, what this is talking about is how we've basically lost our way over time. We've lost the paths when we've created a breach between us and the Father. But over the years, we've understood that these pathways go through the Sabbath days as well as the feast days. Those holy convocations that you read about over there in Leviticus 23. But as we are at the beginning of the year, we want to talk particularly about Passover. It is the first feast of the year and maybe the most important feast of the year for many people watching this video. Most important because it is being the first feast of the year. It is the starting point. You can imagine if you're going to keep up with the seven holy feasts, you might not want to start in the middle with the Feast of Pentecost, or you might not want to start at the end with the Feast of Tabernacles. You will want to start at the beginning, which is the Feast of Passover. So in this video, I want to walk through some texts coming out of our scripture to show you how important the Passover is. I'm going to show you that it is the actually the first commandment given to the children of Israel and then I'm going to show you how it was taken away causing them to dwell in the wilderness for almost 40 years then we're going to show you that it was one of if not the first commandment that was given back to the children of Israel as they left the wilderness after they crossed the river Jordan so let's jump right into it. First of all, I want to show you this website that I'm going to get some information from. This is a website called jufac.org. When you look for the laws or all of the commandments that were given in the Bible, you'll find these 613 different commandments. As you read down through here, if you want to, you can see that there are several people that has gone through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and they've came up with 613 different commandments through the first five books of the Bible. Now, this website here, they've gone in, this jufat.org, they've gone in and categorized a lot of these commandments for us. For instance, the first one was talking about how we treat the Father, and then there's commandments dealing with the Torah, and then there's commandments dealing with signs and symbols, and it goes on. Let me show you back up here. You can see all of these different categories that they have over here where, you categorize, where they've gone in and categorized these 613 different commandments that were compiled by a guy named Rambam. Now, what I've done in order to sort these out is I've put them in an Excel spreadsheet. Now, all I did was copied and pasted those 613 different commandments over into this Excel spreadsheet so that I could work to sort these things out. In order to sort them out, what I did was go on, go on in and sort them by the book that they're found in. EX for Exodus, GEN for Genesis, and Leviticus and so on. They're sorted by the book and even the chapter that they're listed in. To see what are the first commandments given in the Bible. Now, the first commandments, of course, will come from the book of Genesis. It's actually coming from Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, saying to be fruitful and multiply. So let's jump over there and take a look at that right quick, see what it's talking about. 
you come over here and you look at Genesis and you see that our father is contemplating the idea of creating human beings. He says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and over the sea. Then you look down here in 27, it says, and so God created man in his own image. And then verse 28 says, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is the first commandment of the Bible. Thing about it, this commandment was given to all of humanity, including the children of Cain, who slew his brother Abel. This commandment was not necessarily given to the children of Israel. It was given to everybody. Now you look at the second commandment given in the book of Genesis. You would have to go all the way down to chapter 17. And it says to circumcise the male offspring. So let's go and take a look at that. And we see that this commandment was given to Abraham. This is the father making a covenant between himself and Abraham. You see right there in verse 9 and verse 10. And then verse 11 says, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And verse 12 goes on to talk about how you'll circumcise these individuals on the eighth day. But the thing about this commandment is it was given to Abraham. When we come over here and we look at a picture from the time chart of human history, we see that Abraham includes a lot of different people. Now, by the time we get down to Abraham, there's a lot of people groups on the planet. The ones you're looking at here only come from Noah's son, Shem. It doesn't come from either of the two other individuals that got off the boat after the flood which would be Ham and Japheth you'll see those individuals down below but then when you look over here at Abraham you see that Abraham was not only the father of Isaac who went on to have uh, children Jacob and Esau but he was also the father of Ishmael and Ishmael we recognize as the people over in the Middle East. But if you read on in the story, Abraham had a lot more children even after he had Isaac. And so the circumcision would apply to all of those people. It would apply to a lot of people, not just the children of Jacob or the children of Israel that you see over in this area. So what we want to look for is the commandments given to uniquely to the children of Israel. Not necessarily the ones given to the whole world, which this one is not necessarily given to the whole world. It's given to the children of Abraham. But this is a lot of people. Like I said, it's Ishmael, there's Esau and his group. All of these people are required to do the circumcision per the covenant of Abraham. So that's not necessarily what we're looking for. We're looking for the commandments given to the children of, of Israel. Now the next commandment is coming at Genesis 32 and 33. And it says not to eat of the thigh vein which shrank. Let's go over there and take a look at what it's talking about. Now we get over here at the end of chapter 32 in the book of Genesis and what we're talking about is Jacob as he is fleeing from his father-in-law Laban over there and going through the wilderness, going back to where his homeland, he is met with an angelic figure that wrestles with Jacob there. They have a fight out there in, in the desert. And Seems like Jacob is getting the best of this angelic figure until the guy breaks his hip bone, knocks his thigh out of joint. So that's what it's talking about when you look down here at 
32, it says, Therefore the children of Israel eat not the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day. But now I question whether this one is even a commandment at all, or is it just some type of tradition that the children don't eat the sinew that shrank? But I'll leave that down in the comments. Not only would I ask that you will give a comment on whether this is a commandment or a tradition, but if you would, help me out as far as what does this even mean? What is the sinew which shrank in the hollow of the thigh? What, what, what is this that the children of Israel are not supposed to eat? Or if they're not supposed to eat it at all, what, what is it? But let's come back over here and say we'll put a question mark about that one talking about the first commandments of the Bible. So we're already out of the book of Genesis. And so what you have is a commandment given to all of humanity and then another commandment given to Abraham. And then you have one, an obscure com commandment or tradition that was given to Jacob. So then let's see. What are the next commandments? Because those aren't unique to the children of Israel. Now let's see what are the first commandments given to the children of Israel. Since we're out of the book of Genesis, we have to go to the book of Exodus. And again, these are sorted by chapters. And so the next chapter that we see that we start to get commandments is over there in chapter 12 of the book of Exodus. And if you look at these commandments, they're all concerned with Passover. So my argument is that the first commandments given to the children of Israel are all associated with Passover. There's command after command talking about Passover. That Pascal, that's talking about Passover. Each one of these commands that you get in all the way through chapter 12 is talking about how we are to do Passover or how they were to do Passover before they left Egypt. Coming over to this diagram uh, drawn up by Charles Larkin in his book Dispensational Truth is uh, kind of giving us a pictorial diagram of the book of Exodus. And so we jump over there and look at this right quick just to get an idea of what we're talking about. Over here in this area, we see uh, Moses who is up there by the burning bush, kind of getting the command to go in and release the children of Israel. And then over in this section, we have the uh, 10 plagues that were put on Pharaoh. And right as the children of Israel was getting ready to leave uh, Egypt is where you get up to chapter 12, right in this area, right when the firstborn males are about to be destroyed there in Egypt. So what the Passover was all about was how to prevent their firstborn from actually being destroyed by the death angel or Mestima, as the book of Jubilees calls them. Okay, so I think that's extremely important that the first commandments given to the children of Israel are all associated with Passover. So if you look down through here and look at some of the other commandments given in the book of Exodus, you see in chapter 13, he's talking about the firstborns. And these are, you know, that's what Passover was about, was protecting the firstborn of the humans by putting the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And then you go into, there's another commandment over there in chapter 16. And then the next time you see commandments given according to these uh, 613 rules is over there in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 20, which of course is the Ten Commandments. And it goes on into the judgments all the way through chapter 23, which we call the book of the covenant. The book of the covenant goes from chapter 20 to chapter 23. 
So this, I believe, shows the importance of Passover as it was the first commandments given to the children of Israel. And it also puts importance on the Sabbath day, but we'll talk about that in another class. In this one, we're looking at Passover. So let's come over here to the King James Version and let's look at other times when Passover is found in our Bible. All right, so now again, the first time we see the word Passover is all the way up here in chapter 12, verse 11. It says, And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Just for those who don't know this story, that as they were about to leave Egypt, nine plagues has already been put on Egypt. And this last one, as they're about to go, this last plague is going to actually destroy all of the firstborn in the land. But the father told him to put the blood of the lamb on a doorpost and the death angel would pass over the firstborn. And so we read over in, I think it's chapter 49 of the book of Jubilees, how the children of Israel were celebrating this feast as the uh, uh, death angel was going and destroying all of the firstborn males of the Egyptians over there. And it was right after this that the children left Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. They escaped Egypt. So that we read over there in chapter 12. You can read all about that in chapter 12. But let's jump down and see when the next time we hear about Passover. There's 12 and 21. There's 12 and 26 talks about Passover. 12 and 43 as well as 12 and 48 talks about Passover. And then you don't hear or you don't see the word Passover written again until you get all the way to chapter 34 verse 25 is the next time that you see the word Passover listed in the in the Bible. Now, this part of the book of Exodus is over there after Moses had gotten the tables of stone and actually broken them when he found the children of Israel down there worshiping the golden calf. Remember, he came down and he he saw them worshiping the golden calf and he broke the, the tablets and he had to go back up there and get more tablets because the father had to replace them well this is the part of the story that is talking about over here this is this is part of the law that was given to Moses and it's happening to be mentioning if you look at it the way it's written over here it just happens to be mentioning Passover it says and thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning then it goes on and talks about the first fruits it's, it's not really giving it as a commandment it's more like giving instructions associated with the commandment but the thing is it's not the children performing the Passover making it this far into the book of Exodus, the children have only performed Passover one time, and that was the time before they left Egypt. And that is the only other time in the book of Exodus do you even see the word Passover mentioning. So we'll write this down all the way through to the end of the book of Exodus. They only perform Passover one time. All right. So now here we are in the book of Leviticus, which is the, the chapter where we hear about all of the statutes, all of the feast days. And so we go to the next time we see Passover. It's in the book of Numbers, chapter nine. Chapter nine is the next time we see Passover mentioned. But it's not surprising to see it there because when you read chapter 9 verse 1 it says and the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt saying let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. So now if you think about it for a second the children of Israel they performed Passover before they left Egypt that would have been the first year. Now here it is a year later that they're in the wilderness and the father is commanding them or commanding Moses to have the children to perform Passover again. 
And they do. They have Passover again there in the book of Numbers in chapter 9. It says down in 5, And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at evening in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, when you step down through and you look at the times that Passover is mentioned in chapter 9, you see that, you know, down in chapter 6, it starts talking about these two men or these men, these certain men, it says, that were um, uh, unclean. And they were wondering how they were supposed to keep Passover. And it talks about how they were defiled by a dead body. It says right there, we are defiled by the body of a, of a man. And so they were unclean and unable to keep Passover. And so now they go on before Moses and say, hey, Moses, what are we supposed to do? So Moses went to the father and asked the father, what are they supposed to do? And they got an additional commandment. It says right here in verse 11, the 14th day of the second month at evening, they shall keep the Passover. Now, when you read about these feast days, all throughout the Bible, you find out how, how important it is to keep the feast on the appointed day. It says that time after time, you have to keep the feast on the, on the exact day. You can't just do Passover any day you want, or you can't do tabernacles any day you want. Well, here it is. The only feast out of all seven that's actually a second chance is given. I think that too lends to the idea of how important Passover it is because they actually got a second chance to do it again. If they for some reason was unclean the first month, they got a second chance. No other no other feast are they given a second chance or another day to do that. And so you see in here, the other times that Passover is mentioned, the word Passover is mentioned there in chapter 9 of the book of Numbers. The last time being there in Numbers chapter 9 verse 14. And so when we do a search to find out when the next time that Passover is being used, you go all the way up to Numbers chapter 28 and 16. Numbers chapter 28 and 16 is when you see the word Passover being used here. But the thing about the 28th chapter of Numbers, they've already been in the desert for 40 years. These are the commandments that you're looking at that were given up here in chapter 28 and I realize I'm going backwards you can pause or go grab your Bible and look at Numbers chapter 28 and see these commandments here but I'm taking you back to a certain place right here to 27 and 22 and Moses did as the Lord commanded him and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. This is right when Moses is about to die. He's actually given the reins over to Joshua is the next time that you even see the word Passover. They haven't done the Passover feast since chapter nine. And that was thirty nine years ago. Thirty nine years ago. They did Passover and they haven't done it since. They haven't even been told to do it. If you go back to chapter 9, and we will, let's jump back over to chapter 9. You see that the that the Lord is, is commanding Moses to have the children to keep the Passover, but all of, for the next 39 years, they don't even get a commandment to keep. Passover. It's like they almost even forgot about Passover when you think that it was it, it was it was only only mentioned in the commandments, except when they was about to leave Egypt way back over in chapter 12. They kept it there in chapter 12. 
It was only mentioned in the commandments over there in chapter 34 of the book of Exodus, but they didn't keep it. It was only given as a command, but it was mentioned over there in the book of Leviticus. Like we said, that's the second book or the second half of the book of Exodus. And when you, when you end Exodus and look at Leviticus, it almost looks like they were supposed to go together because they was building the temple there at the end of Exodus. And then at the beginning of Leviticus, they're actually telling them how to make the sacrifices in that tabernacle that they had built. And it doesn't give any timelines or anything. It's just a bunch of rules and stuff that's given to the Levitical priests. It seems like it, but when it's only when you get into the book of numbers, which, you know, they, they call it the Greek term is the book of numbers, but the Hebrew term, the Hebrew title for that book is actually called in the wilderness that you hear about the children, how they are in the wilderness for those 39 years and what they had to go through. And, you know, the different stuff that they went through there in the wilderness for those 40 years. Well, one thing that they didn't go through, except for the very first year or the, the, the very next year after they came out of Egypt, what they didn't go through was Passover. They didn't do Passover. And you say, well, why? Why didn't the father command them to do Passover? Well, let me come over here to this little image. It's, it's called Exodus to Promised Land. Um, I got this off of Google. You can probably find it over there. It's coming from a website called uh, CovenantRevelations.com or something like that. Well, when you look over here in, in Numbers, right in this area right here where they had uh, the second Passover, it says supplementary Passover, but it was the second Passover. Right after this, they journey and they go to Aaron. And then what happens? They start complaining. Now, I wish Charles Larkin had created one of those handy dandy flow charts for the book of Numbers that he created for the Exodus and Genesis and all them other books, but he didn't. I'll keep looking for one so it can give us a visual understanding of what they went through through in the book of Numbers. But then we start to get down here into chapter 13 when the father is about to send these individuals over to spy out the land. This is important. I know I'm kind of messing it up. But you have these individuals that's going out here to spy out the land. This is Joshua and Caleb and 10 other individuals from these certain tribes it mentions here are about to go into Kadesh and look at these and look at the promised land. But then what happens by the time you get down here to verse 26 after the individuals have gone in and seen all of the land they come back and they start giving the report of the land and they put fear in the hearts of the children of Israel the father has told these individuals to go spy it out and they come back talking about giants and how you know they're going to be squashed like grasshoppers or whatever and the children of Israel start to cry out and say Wow, well, we want to go back to Egypt. Why have you brought us out here to be destroyed by these people? And so down here in verse 14, they're actually rebelling against the Lord. They're ready to go back to Egypt. Then the father threatens to destroy them all. And then you have Moses that comes in and intercedes for the people over here in about verse 12 or verse 13 of uh, chapter 14. But then coming all the way down here to verse 20 and the Lord is about to punish the people for what they have done. Now they're about to lose the opportunity to go into the promised land. So you say, well, why didn't they perform the feast of Passover anymore? These individuals that came out of uh, out of Egypt. Why are they now having to walk around this desert because they complained? And along with that, they're not doing the Feast of Passover. And that's why you don't see Passover done anymore for 39 years. This, I believe, is what separated them from the promised land and kept them in the wilderness for these 40 years. Because the Lord kept Passover from them. They were not instructed to do Passover anymore.
Now, you have to bear with me for a minute because, you know, I, I understand some people saying, well, no, they complained. They, they complained was the reason why they stayed out there in the wilderness for all of these 40 years. But I would argue that complaining is not a sin. Complaining is not a transgression of the law. They would have to have done something in order to break the laws in order for them to be punished. And complaining is not it. We complain all the time. But what did complaining get them? Complaining got Passover taken away from them and the other feast days taken away from them. That was that's what caused them to be out in the wilderness for these 40 years was because these feast days was taken away. And that's why we get the next time we see Passover is all the way down there with Joshua. Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit about them and they trusted in the father and believed what the father said and even wanted to go on into the promised land. They was the only ones that were allowed to go into the promised land. And so that's why up here in chapter 28, you after the reins have been turned over to Joshua, Joshua have been put in been put in charge of the children of Israel. Do you now start to see them being commanded once again to do the feast of Passover that's how important Passover is they haven't even heard about Passover again now I know some people say what about the book of what about the book of Deuteronomy wasn't Passover commanded in Deuteronomy and I would say yes it was you see over here in chapter 16 they're saying to observe the month Abib and keep Passover in verse 2, 16 and 2, it says, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord. And then down in, in verse 5, he's talking about Passover in the book of Deuteronomy. And in uh, verse 6, it's talking about Passover. So Passover was mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. It was given to them as a law in Deuteronomy. But let me show you something that I know I missed in the book of Deuteronomy the first few times I read it. And I believe some others might have missed it, too. You look down here in Deuteronomy in uh, verse three of chapter one. And it came to pass in the 40th year of the 11th month. This Deuteronomy was written 40 years later. Deuteronomy was written at the end of that 40 year journey. So by now, this is when Moses is turning everything over to Joshua. So again, Passover wasn't commanded for the children of Israel, but the first year when they was about to leave Egypt, and it was commanded again in the second year after they had left Egypt, but it wasn't commanded again until 40 years later. 40 years later was, was Passover talked about and it's when they was going to the promised land and I remind you that when it was when they went through Passover before back there in Numbers chapter 9 what happened next they started traveling into the promised land three four five chapters later they were ready to go into the promised land almost immediately after I have done Passover they was ready to go into the promised land they just started complaining and started messing up and started you know didn't didn't do right and so you say, well, when was the next time we hear about Passover? You have to jump all the way down here to the book of Joshua. Yep. All the way down here in Joshua was when they actually kept the feast of Passover. This is right after they had crossed the river Jordan. Now they're actually keeping the feast of Passover. This is the third time that the feast of Passover was kept. After they was in the plains of Jericho, Right before they went and blew down the walls of Jericho, what were they doing? They was out there keeping the feast of Passover. That's how important this feast is. I mean, are you seeing this? This is the third time that they've done Passover in chapter 5 of Joshua. Now, if you, if you fast forward to, through time, and you think about some of the events that's taking place. Go all the way through to when you start hearing about this Nebuchadnezzar individual. 
Well, one of the first things you hear about Nebuchadnezzar is he goes in and takes all of the sacrificial instruments away, making it so that the children of Israel could not keep Passover. And so what happened after they weren't, weren't able to keep Passover? They ended up in bondage in Babylon for 70 years. Now, right here, this is uh, this is King Jos Josiah. He's gotten the word that the children of Israel are about to go in his bondage for 70 years. And he tries to, this is 2 Kings chapter 23, and he tries to keep the Feast of Passover. He does a good job of keeping the Feast of Passover. It says that it hasn't been done like this since Samuel. But the father blesses him for his efforts, but it still doesn't keep them out of uh, Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar still goes in and sacks them and takes away all of the instruments. So the children of Israel are in bondage for 70 years. They're there in captivity. But we jump all the way up to the book of Ezra and look what the first thing that they do when they get ready to leave Babylon they keep Passover. They keep Passover. That's the first thing that they did when they get ready to leave Babylon. This is talking about the second temple here, how they've actually got the second temple completed uh, in the, uh, what does it say, in the, in the uh, sixth year of Darius, the king over there. They've actually got the second temple completed after the first one was destroyed. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first temple, took all of the stuff away. Now you have um, them rebuilding it over here in Ezra. And so they dedicate the house in like the first first day of the first month and over there. And then the first thing they do is they keep Passover. That's how important this holiday and this feast is as far as our captivity, as far as the children of Israel is concerned, is Passover. It is the first feast of the year. It is extremely important to keep Passover. And then if you fast forward even farther through time, you come in 70 AD when you had the second temple being destroyed. So once again, the people weren't able to keep Passover. And what happened to them that time? Well, they are being scattered. That's why the children of Israel are scattered to this day, because they have not been keeping the feast of Passover until now. And so what's promised in the end times? Well, once again, the children of Israel will start to keep the feast of Passover and the other feasts and they will be reunited under the father again and be ready to go into the promised land. It's all about Passover. So for those of you wanting to be reconnected with the father, you should understand that we have to do Passover. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up there, y'all. Go ahead and look for our channel for some other classes on when Passover is, how we are to perform Passover, where we are to perform Passover. I hope this one explains why we are to, to perform Passover. And this time of the season, it's all about Passover. <laughs>